Yeah, hello to everybody, and thanks to the ECEEE for giving me the opportunity to present our recent uh, report, How Energy Efficiency Cuts Cost for a Two-Degree Future, here in this policy seminar, and also thanks to Tyler for setting the perfect stage for presenting it by giving us the broad picture of the global developments and also the savings of, of energy efficiency that have been achieved in the past. And because I want to tackle the question of how, uh, how much can we save by um, prioritizing energy efficiency in, uh, in the national determined contributions for, um, for reaching the two degree target. Or you even see here that we are now a bit out of date with our title. It should be well below two degree or even 1.5 degree. I will shortly comment on that too. But in a way, the question stays the same, uh, of course. As Tyler has told us, energy efficiency is very important for, uh, for achieving this target, but still there is some leeway between going for a more a pathway that has a lot of uh, decarbonization options, so decarboniz decarbonizing the supply of e energy, or to more focus on reducing the demand to, to use energy more efficient, efficiently in the end use sectors. So I will... Um, after a short interaction, I will tell you what we have done in this report and first show you the global uh, results we found, but we have also focused on a six focus regions. This is uh, the US and the EU, China and India, Brazil and Mexico, and I will also uh, at least comment on three of this, uh, uh, these regions, and we will, of course, later on hear a lot more about the EU, I guess. Um, so the background, what was the main uh, motivation for doing this study. So it yeah, was set up by Climate Works, and they asked the question, okay, everybody knows energy efficiency t plays an important role in decarbonization, but what is actually the impact of a, a pathway that focuses more on energy efficiency compared to one that focusing, focuses on decarbonizing supply? And there's, um, there's a lot of studies around on, on the on the savings that are delivered by energy efficiency in general, but here we really just con compare, okay, we assume that we choose a scenario where we achieve the two degree scenario, but which pathway is, is the cheapest one? And, um, and okay, there has been some work in the global energy assessment, but I think the, this question wasn't answered before in this uh, uh, concise manner as, as we did it. And, um, in particular, we also looked at the existing policies in the regions, as you will see, to compare uh, which, which part of the potentials is actually addressed today. And you will see that there are also differences between the regions, and so this is not one answer for the whole world, but the answer differs depending on which country, which region you come from. So first, a short look at the history, but I think this has been mainly been said by Tyler already, that. Um, in the past, the biggest emitters have already achieved a significant um, reduction in energy int intensity. I assume that you are uh, familiar with reading this kind of diagrams, but let me shortly um, recall that this is, um, so the energy intensity is just the amount of energy spent per GDP. In, um, and uh, so it's the amount of energy used to produce one unit of GDP. And, uh, you see uh, the development from, from the 1990s to the year 2013. And in the industry sector, so China started the worst, but they have also achieved the most significant savings, but still they, are, they have the highest energy intensities. So still they are not at the, at the global average or even above the, the highest, the other high emitting countries. And a similar um, development can be seen for the transport sector for the U.S., who started out the worst, and with their CAFE standards, they have continuously been uh, increasing energy efficiency, but still they are far from being uh, as good as, as the other regions. And so you can already see here that for the other regions, it's even, even more difficult to, to uh, reduce energy intensity to a significant amount, but there are, of course, a lot of potentials, and I will tell you more about this. So before going into the details of the methodology, let me give you a short glimpse on, on the overall results. So as I said before, we have compared two pathways, the energy efficient pathway, uh, which of course also has to include some renewables to, to achieve the two degree target. 
but to a much less extent than the energy intensive pathway, which also makes use of nuclear power and CCS, um, depending on the region and in, in, in which amount. And what we find is that when we look at the cumulative savings from 2015 to 2030 of the energy efficient pathways in, and this is net cost reduction, so we consider the investments, uh, the operating costs and the fuel costs and uh, and um, to, a, to, a, to a reference technology in, in, in a baseline scenario. And we find that the, the energy efficient pathway saves 2.5 to 2.8 trillion uh, dollars uh, when we accumulate the savings. Um, and this uncertainty is related to the, the impact of rebound effects that you probably well know better than me is, is qu quite, uh, there are quite some debates about, uh, about the, um, the amount of rebounds we will, f we will see. And when we look at the annual savings only in the year 2030, then it's, it's um, so th the annual savings are continuously increasing and they end up at 440 to 480 billion dollars. And we also have looked at what have policies in three regions, the China, China the EU, and the United States, uh, achieved in reducing the future costs to reach the two degree target. So because of the energy efficiency in the past, the increase of energy efficiency, we, we have to do less in the future. And this uh, accumulates to $750 billion um, till 2030. Okay, now uh, the whole story. So what we've done to um, assess our general goal to, to compare the costs of an uh, energy efficient pathway and uh, and uh, an energy intensive pathway. We have um, looked at the existing policies in the six focus regions um, and uh, checked to which extent they, uh, they already address the existing potentials. We have um, compiled a review of two degree scenarios and looked what is the amount of energy efficiency that is in these two degree scenarios. So there's a wide span. Some of them have a lot of energy efficiency in there, some of them have less to, to get a reasonable region of energy intensities, a regional range of energy intensities that we, um, we consider then in our own projection of cost reductions um, based on energy efficiency policies and alternative decarbonization measure, measures. And we did this based on the, um, an unpublished update of the uh, well-known McKinsey marginal abatement cost curves. Um, and um, yeah, we looked at the, until 2030 for all six focus regions and had also some regional experts included to ground truth our, our results to the local policies. And uh, so who was involved, it was, uh, besides Fraunhofer Easy, we had the New Climate Institute and the Green Workers uh, in, in, the, in the project team. And we also had a, a steering com committee with well-known um, high-level stakeholders. Um, Niels was there, you will be known, but also uh, Stephen Nadel from ACEEE and s some other guys you may know or you may not. Um, and we had the local experts. I don't want to go into the details here. It's just that um, there will, to show you that we had um, regional experts from every, all of the six focus regions. And so now I come to the methodology and also to the results. Um, so what you see here sketched is um, the typical uh, marginal abatement cost curves where you see costs and benefits in the vertical axis. So um, the interventions shown here, they have positive costs. So they, uh, they produce net additional costs compared to a reference technologies while those down here have produced in a way cost savings benefits compared to the reference technology. And, uh, and uh, on the X axis, we just show the emission reduction. So um, this one is, has uh, would have a particularly large uh, potential for emission reduction. And they are um, marked by color compared by the sector type they come from. So blue is generation, yellow is buildings and industry, and green is transport. And what you immediately see here is that, although this is just a sketch, the usual picture is that you find the end use sectors more down here, while the generation technologies typically have, at least at the moment, um, positive net costs. So the, of course the, the costs from renewables are uh, reducing quite fast, but still um, they are 
more expensive than reference technologies. And then we chose the two pathways. So on, in the energy efficient pathway, we just included generation decarbonization options as much as needed to, to reach a two degree uh, target. And we did this based on the, on the um, 450 ppm scenario from the IEA that Tyler also showed to us. And, um, and then we chose a pathway where we focused on the uh, decarbonization of the supply of energy and only in included energy efficiency as much as needed. And so the first qualitative findings that you see here is that in the energy efficient pathway, we have uh, the high efficiency in the end use sector. It grants a signif significant flexibility in choosing how to decarbonize supply. Of course, here we chose the, the cheapest measures or the ones with the least cost, but maybe for acceptance reasons or whatever, you could also just exchange those for, for one of the gray ones for a little higher costs, but you are flexible to choose. And a lot of this flexibility um, disappears when we look at the energy intensive pathway. And when we uh, look here at the energy intensive pathway, we also see that we had to include, depending on the region, quite a number of energy in efficiency measures to reach it, to achieve the emissions necessary for, it, for the two degree target. And so in, in total, we had to uh, reduce the um, energy, energy demand in the end use sectors by 7% by 2030. And all in all, both pathways, they mitigate the same amount of emissions annually, maybe 5.4 gigatons. Uh, but as I said before, the annual costs of the energy efficiency pathway are 440 to 480 billion dollars less globally. So let's take a closer look at, at, the, at the sectors. Here's a, a similar sketch where we have aggregated um, the results by sectors. And uh, what you see here is um, that, so in the transport sector, we have the efficiency options like reducing uh, fuel consumption of, of cars or uh, um, but also modal shifts in here. And on the other hand, we have this smaller bar here that represents biofuels and, uh, and other options that are, um, um, yeah, that are not related to efficiency. And you see that th this one is, has much lower costs or much higher benefits and also a much larger potential. And for the, for the industry sector, we see that the efficiency options, they are far more less cost intensive than the, than the uh, potentials when you, we look, for example, at CCS technologies or other process emission uh, options to avoid emissions. In the, in the building sector, so by buildings I mean both buildings and appliances, we see that the picture is more diverse. So there are uh, options with very high benefits, but there are also options that are quite expensive. And therefore we just see here, uh, in the, in the mean, we just see a, a lower uh, benefit than in the other sectors. But this just means that you have to have to look, depending on the region, so how how much uh, how how many buildings in our building do, do I need to renovate or to which degree, and uh, so on. And finally, oh, pre-finally, um, the abatement potentials of renewables. And nuclear power, they are by far, by far the largest, but if we want to fully exploit this, but you see that it has positive net costs, then it will be very expensive. This is what happens in the energy intensive pathway. And finally, the use of carbon capture and storage, both for power generation and industrial processes, can be avoided by uh, at least until 2030 in, in this energy efficient pathway. We don't talk about thereafter because this will, uh, yeah. It may be the case that we will need CCS there, depending on to whether we want to the, reach the 1.5 degree goal, goal or the two degree goal. So um, now, coming from the general results to to the more regional ones, um, here is an overview, and I will go into the details on the next slides of uh, the findings for the regions. So what you see here is the achieved emissions by. In, 
in purple um, that we took from the from the 450 ppm scenario from the wet energy outlook and um, and the annual savings and then the main potentials by 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 sector or the most important um, gaps that can be addressed by by energy efficiency policies in the future and uh, um, so I immediately go to uh, to the regions. I will talk about China now, the um, Brazil and the EU. But if you want me to, I can also comment on the other regions in, in the discussion. So for China, we find that actually already the intensive intensive pathway requires uh, a huge an annual uh, reduction of annual consumption. So by 14 exajoule. Um, in, in 2030 and compared to, to, uh, to, the, to the current policy scenario of the IEA. And, um, but still the efficient pathway can achieve even higher savings, so depending on the rebound, 4.726 exajoule. And the realization of this additional savings will reduce net costs by quite a lot. Um, when we look in, in, on the total amount, but when we look at the savings per ton of CO2, it's 10 to 12 US dollar. That's not that much. But this is mainly reflects the fact that there are a lot of savings already in the, in, in the, in the intensive pathway. So now when we look at the historic and current policies, what we, we found is, as I showed you in the, in the figure in the beginning, in particular in, indus in the industry sector, China has made a lot of progress with the top 1,000 and the top 10,000 program. And this has already decreased the future net cost by more than $50 billion per year. So this is really savings that yeah, are realized every, every year. Um, and still there remain significant unaddressed potentials uh, in, in, in the industry sector, in particular in the chemicals and the iron and steel sector but also in petroleum processing and coking. And uh, even more in other sectors like the transport sector, uh, there are additional efforts required like um, reducing fuel com consumption by, for example, by, by um, installing very strong um, standards or also by a modal shift in public and freight transport where, of course, China is doing some in, the, in uh, Making some progress on, on the, on installing railways, uh, for long t long distances, but there's of still um, a lot to do. So coming now to um, to Brazil, uh, here um, we find in okay, in total terms it's of course much lower savings, but st but the um, relation of the numbers is, is similar that there are 50 percent higher savings in the energy efficient pathway. And um, the annual net cost reductions, I will, let me just say that here the savings per ton of CO2, they are much, much higher. And this is related to the fact that in the intensive pathway, they don't need a lot of energy efficiency they, because they will mostly achieve their reductions by, by land use changes uh, or, or avoiding deforestation. deforestation. And therefore, here we find much higher savings. And when we look at the current policies, uh, so we didn't look at the historic savings here because there's very few data available on that, but also the impacts, as far as we could see, uh, have been marginal, marginal when we can look at this, this global scale. And um, they have make some, made some progress in the building sector with the ProCell program, but also here there are significant potentials for retrofits of HVACs and air conditionings. And um, on the other hand, in the transport sector and the industry sector, they are really growing sectors in Brazil with, uh, with uh, strongly growing emissions. And there um, is a huge gap for, for introducing energy efficiency policies in Brazil. So coming now to the EU, though I have to say that probably most of you are much more, uh, um, much, um, have much more expertise for the EU than I do have but um, let me tr um, anyway show our results for the EU to you. Um, so here we find um, 
that the efficiency pathway it can double the savings uh, from from the uh, compared to the intensive pathway, and also this comes with very very high uh, additional savings um, when we calculate the savings per ton of CO2 emissions. Um, so it's above seventy dollars, uh, and uh, so the the reason here is that um, um, yeah. On the one hand, that that in the intensive pathways there is not too much energy efficiency needed, but also also that the the high cost economy that we have allows to achieve much higher uh, cost reductions than, for example, in China. When we look at current policies, we see that historical policies have uh, have had a lower impact compared on on the reduction of future costs. Again, this is related to the fact that in the EU we started at much lower levels of energy intensity and therefore uh, couldn't go that much down as, as China and, and as the US as I showed you on the, on the historic slide in the beginning. But the EU, EU is on a good track with the re revision of the EED and a concrete energy efficiency target for 2030, though we will probably have some discussions about um, yeah, how ambitious the 2030 goal should be. Um, and um, the Eco Design Directive will, of course, also play uh, an important role in the future. When we look at industry, it, the problem is that it, realizing energy efficiency will mainly depend on the on a, um, reform of the EU um, emission trading scheme, which, as you know, has been dysfunctional more or less in the past in, in many ways. So um, here, a reform is definitely needed uh, from from this from the point of the potentials that it can be realized. And um, also the order, only moderate fuel economy standards for LDVs and, and uh, the lack of um, policies for HDVs, um, of strong policies for HDVs pose additional potentials for improvements. Finally, the, also the retrofit of existing buildings is not, there's no, um, standard for the whole EU, it differs by country, and there are a lot of potentials to, um, to realize here too. So to conclude, um, I j just so show you the results for all six regions in the overview, and let me just say that, again, we found here, as in many studies before, that when we look at just at the net costs of all these energy efficiency measures, um, they, have, they even produce benefits, and then you may pose the question, so why aren't they realized yet? If, if, they, uh, if the net costs are negative. And of course, there are many non-financial barriers um, in, in for energy efficiency measures, like the, the large amount of actors that is involved in this, in realizing them, then the, the mismatch between the actors and the benef beneficiaries. And, uh, and therefore, it's really uh, Im important to address these non-financial barriers, and, uh, and this may produce some additional transaction costs but the cost savings are that large that we can, uh, uh, it's not a problem to have to, to spend some money on, on transaction costs, I think. So, um, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. And um, maybe I just um, point you to um, that the fact that you can, of course, download the report. Um, I'm sorry that I didn't provide the link here, but I also brought the two-page summary. You can find it out, outside and there you definitely find the link on um, where to download the study. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, we also hear if there's any urgent questions for understanding here, we will take one or two. We have two here first. Thank you very much. Erwin Cornelis of uh, Vito Belgium. Thank you for your interesting presentation. My question concerns the basis of your research, the cost abatement curve of McKinsey, and actually I was wondering to what extent this cost curve has been validated. Mm -hmm. Because Climate Works is, is also in cooperation with McKinsey, we were able to, to assess the, um, also the data that is not published by, by McKinsey, and, and there's even an, an update that has not been published but should be published soon of this, so there will be a version 3.0 of the McKinsey cost caps. And we could, uh, um, yeah, by this we, of course, had some comparisons with other cost curves and um, 
uh, in, insights by having insights in the in in these data, we could verify that um, uh, their assumptions are um, to a certain extent reasonable. But of course, there, are, mm -hmm. as you know, there are a lot of debates about these curves, and uh, and so you should see this as a meta study of the McKinsey curves and all the criticism that you um, can put to it. You can still be put to also this kind of uh, analysis. Please. My name is Dirk van Orsoven. I'm an independent energy engineer here in Belgium. Uh, basically, yeah. my question is the following. Um, are all energy efficiency measures included in this graph? Because I see on the left-hand side, there are a lot of them which, are, which have a, a negative cost, uh, which uh, gain money. But if we take that triangle, and you could say approximately that's it, a linear uh, curve, if we would uh, have, have a curve uh, going through it. It's a, if we would interpret that as a kind of law, uh, how the energy efficiency versus cost measures are, are intrinsically available technologically and economically if fully developed, and we would extrapolate that beyond the zero point, then there would be a much larger triangle with positive costs, so which would cost more than, than they bring benefit. Uh, but it would be much larger than the orange bars that you have here. So I always have had the feeling that in, in the study, they primarily focused on those energy efficiency measures which, are, which pay for themselves, and the others are not fully taken into account, because generally you say we, we don't care about them. But if we compare them to the other options uh, in generation, which have an extra cost, then there may be more energy efficiency measures that are still cheaper, but which are not included in the study and, and in the graph. Could you comment on that or? Yeah, uh, so I think, so there are quite a lot here that have also costs in the order of the generation uh, technologies. So these are included, but there are two kinds of cut cutoffs. So if, if the total potential of emission reductions is too small, then they were excluded, and of course there was some cutoff at a certain cost. Uh, though I have to say, in the McKinsey data we got, there are some with even several hundreds of dollars per ton of CO2 emissions. Uh, we did an extra cut then uh, here for at $200. Um, but yes, there are these kind of measures, but they are excluded for, for good reasons, I think. But my question was mainly about those that are cheaper than what is shown on the graph, than the maximum on the graph. So the orange areas with a positive cost are very small areas compared to those with the negative cost. If we would extrapolate, well, I, I can difficultly explain what I mean, but if you would extrapolate that line with the negative cost, I would expect within the graph, within the re range of the graph, much more uh, energy efficiency measures still. Yeah, okay, maybe this is really just a sketch. You shouldn't take it too se too seriously. Uh, yeah, it, it it was meant to to yeah to to explain the the methodology to you, but but they may be broader than than they are shown in the picture. There, if the if they had a significant potential and were were below this cost level, then they were included. 